Stewardship and Communications Technician, and uh, Jeff Sharp is also here. He's a conservation services specialist, and then we have tech support with Nicole and Emily, um, and we all work here at St. Clair. Uh, so thanks for joining us. I can't wait to hear from our panelists. Uh, I do just have like a little introduction to St. Clair and where we all live. So you Conservation Authority. There's 36 in Ontario, and they're actually pretty unique. Not a lot of people know that um, they're not common in the world. Uh, the way our system works is actually very unique. I think there's one other system like this in New Zealand, uh, but we are watershed based, and the um, Conservation Authority across Ontario serves. That'd be a bit weird because they're like in person. <laughs> um. Uh, and we serve almost 95% of Ontario's entire population. Okay. And then St. Clair, we are one of the largest ones, and we are one of the most southern conservation authority. We were established in 1961, and we actually started as the Sydney Ham Valley Conservation Authority, and now we are the St. Clair region. Um, and the only difference is that we kind of added on the Lake Huron tributaries and then uh, Lake St. Clair, St. Clair River tributaries. 14 sub-watersheds, and there are 17 municipalities on our boundaries, so. We're just nice and big. Uh, like all CAs, we have conservation areas, uh, campgrounds and stuff, just kind of wanted to show where they are. So Jeff and I both work for stewardship and uh, conservation services. So we work a lot with landowners, farmers, and we help try and find funding or just providing technical assistance uh, to implement different habitat restoration projects or best management practices. Do you try and then source out projects that uh, prioritize them or are based on those watersheds? Is that that's your con like When somebody comes to you, you're going, are you based on a watershed that we want to protect? Or is it just like you reach out to anybody, but you're really just trying to get isolate those those areas? Is that the purpose behind the, the conservation authority itself is to manage effluent or runoff or whatever in these watersheds? Is that the purpose yeah, of it? Yeah, uh, certain. It kind of comes down to our grant funding streams. Uh, uh -huh. Some of them are determined on like a lot of them focus on the Sydenham and actually the east branch of the Sydenham because it's high in aquatic species at risk, okay. and then. We also try and focus more on agricultural land and trying to implement those practices on those lands compared to like urban properties. Yeah, um, water ditches and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, we do a ditches. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then um, if farmers have marginal land or just land they want to convert into habitat restoration, those as well. So one of the main features in our watershed is the Sydenham River. It is a biological treasure in all of Canada. It has um, a large assortment of species in it and a large assortment of species at risk. So it is. Um, it also lies in the Carolinian life zone. So that top picture there is the Carolinian life zone. It is the smallest life zone in Canada. It only takes up about 1% of Canada's land mass, but has over 25% of our human population in it. So it's a lot of pressure on a small chunk of land. Um, so, you know, there's stuff the Conservation Authority is doing, there's stuff the government's doing, and then there's stuff we can do as individuals, which should lead us into kind of what we're going to talk about today. Okay, and then I just wanted to point out we have this really cool resource. Uh, it's all about the Sydenham River species at risk in it uh, and threats kind of facing it, and then what we can do. There's a lot of resources on it. That's it. Um, that's just kind of our 
contact information. And then I am going to get right into it. I'm going to start with Jessica Sweetin, who is a registered professional forester. She owns and runs a consulting company called the Sobble Forestry that provides ecological insight to landowners, species at risk permitting, and native plant design for the modern world. She also runs a native plant nursery called Bedford Native Plants with her sister, Sarah. Additionally, Jessica is the Vegetation Services Coordinator for the West Region of the Ministry of Transportation, where she is able to transition our ping roadways from non-native species into suitable native species and combat the ongoing spread of frag muddies and other non-native species. Jessica loves biodiversity and the climate of southern Ontario and gets outside as much as she can to enjoy the four seasons of our region. Awesome. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. And so for my presentation, which I tried to keep short, but um, I just, I, because we're kind of getting into planting season, I figured it was a good time to talk about what I think is the coolest part about native plants, and that's that you can eat them. So my presentation, I, knowing what was going to follow me <laughs> with these guys, I figured I would take up this niche part of, this, this part of the market. So um, delicious management decisions, the world of native edibles. And so... Oh, there we go. Okay, oops, oh, I did it too. There we go. Okay. So, that's, oh, okay, well, oops, I missed the slide. It happened. Okay. So, I just kind of wanted to talk about, it, and it, it, the, the title, you can't see the top of it, but it says, Traditional Chinese Medicine and Native Plants, Explained. And um, so, Eastern Medicine or Traditional uh, Chinese Medicine approaches health and medicine encompassing how the human body interacts with all the aspects of its environment. Um, this includes the body's reaction to season, weather, time of day, our diet, and even our emotional state. This system uses herbs, acupuncture, and lifestyle components to lead patients towards a healthy life. It's a very dynamic system, changing by person, season, place, and local plant, by the, that plant availability. Um, and so at the bottom of it, it explains, you may have wondered why I'm talking about traditional Chinese medicine. And it's not that these applications haven't been used by our indigenous people. If you think about the healing circle and the drumming, they did it. It's just that as Canadians, we haven't spent the time to actually create as much resources for me to put into this presentation. So when you think about traditional Chinese medicine and you think about North America, we have our own set. And so what kind of I, I would really like people to think about is that, um, what's his name? It's not Socrates, it's the other one, but let food be thy medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's what these cultures are looking at it as, is they're not necessarily thinking that, you know, you're out there collecting all of these medicines, and there is times when you need that, but effectively, let food be thy medicine. And when you plant native plants, versus say if you're going to use a native blueberry versus a, cultural, a cultivar of a blueberry, the native blueberry is going to be smaller, it's not going to produce as abundantly, it will not require as much fertilizer input, and it's going to have a higher amount of antioxidants to it. So you're going to get so much more out of that plant by it being a less, it, it, like effectively what we breed into plants is that we want them to have more sugars in them. But if you, I don't know if anyone here has ever collected um, the little, well, well, I was thinking the wild strawberries oh, that grow as a weed in your lawn. Yeah. You, like that, then you remember, this is why those strawberry candies taste that way. And it's because they're so much better. This is very tiny. So when it comes to there's just a huge, abundant source of native plants that you can use. And for me, I like to use them in a garden setting. And you can really make them quite ornamental. Like I, I really like to say that our company does designs for the modern world. And so effectively, when we do a design, we are always trying to make it not look native. And so Larry here is way better at naturalization than I am. Like, that's, that's his forte. But I've always wanted to get, like, the we, we've we used clients like Grogs and McPherson's. We have done the beds in downtown Grand Bend. And in those locations, effectively, they just would tell me to make it look good, and I would make it all native. <laughs> you know, like, it wasn't, they, I wasn't hired as a native plant person. I was just hired as somebody who would care. So we were, we were trying to kind of complement the typical kind of native plant gardening that's out there into this world of people that are not looking for native plants. They just want something to look good and you can kind of get them everywhere. So, But anyways, back to native edibles. Um, both North American and traditional Chinese medicine practices are focused on lifestyle and healthy diet rather than pain management. So when you think about native edibles, you're kind of thinking about the vitality of you as a human because you both get the activity of gardening and you get the benefits of the plant. 
Okay, so I just basically wanted to give out some, some a few, the, the next two slides are just lists of plants. And, and what I actually noticed on here, now as I said, the wild strawberries, it is not on either list. <laughs> <laughs> um, so berries, you have blueberries, wild raspberries, current, and then sand cherry, like, and sand cherry is one of the most beautiful, like, for the non-native plant people out there, I think it is like the best plant that you can put into your sand garden. It is so cute. It's just, it's just beautiful. Yeah, right um, it's, it's amazing. You really, it, it effectively is, is only native on the shorelines of Lambton, so like, of, like I suppose Chatham and Lambton, but it would be native to the entire, like it, it depends on the lines that you're drawing. I do think that something that's very important in native plants is that we adhere to at least like a couple counties boundaries, taking a plant from three or four counties away and then moving it here, you're kind of going beyond what the limits of what native plants should be designed as. Do you know if junipers are considered native, native, native? So we have two native junipers in so both of those counties. So you have, all the time. yeah, so you have those. juniperus virginiana, which is the tree form, and then you have juniperus communis, which is the shrub form. Sure. Yeah, a very difficult use to buy the shrub form, but if you know anyone who is selling it, as a, like in the world of non-native plants, that medium-sized evergreen shrub is really... I'd love to know so who's it. Is no, they're both native. Oh. Yes, yes. I mean, when I say for non-native plant people, yes. like when I'm planting in these places for people who are not looking for native plants, a medium-sized evergreen shrub is really, yes. in my designs, I'd love to have access to the juniper communist, but I, like, the only guy who ever sold it was Norm. Norm, He did yeah. such a good job with that yeah. plant. Oh, anyway, so then nuts. Um, for sand plants, uh, the, the white oak makes a great flower. And then white pine seeds are actually one of the only other species other than the Mediterranean pine that's known for pine nuts. And so if you wanted to do something like a pesto, you could do a garlic mustard pesto, eat the invasives and a few natives. And um, you could do that with your white pine seeds. <laughs> go pick a squirrel's cash. Um, and then, and, and honestly, like, I don't know if anyone in here has ever made white pine tea. But it is, it's super easy, it's super delicious. I do like a, a girls group once a month and it is, we make white pine tea every single time. So it's super, like it, it has a, an abundance of vitamin C in it, but really it just effectively tastes good and it's easy. So. How do you get a white pine nut stuff that's white pine tree? So you would collect the pine cones? Yeah. And then steal a squirrel's cash. You know, and then you steal squirrel's cash. You'll find them like they'll like mound them up nicely. It's half of it there, but you know, and you would um, put it in the oven, and then you would get it to fully open. It'll drop all the seeds in the oven, and then what you can do is you can put a stick underneath of that, and then you have the most beautiful Christmas decoration. Yeah, because <laughs> a white pine um, pine cone after you put it in the oven, like at like way lower than two ten Fahrenheit, where it would burn, but um. It, they all open and then the seeds fall out, is that it? Yeah, then the seeds oh, fall out. I used to do yeah. that. I used to set them on my computer. The cones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cones yeah. And they yeah. crack on yeah. 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 <laughs> and, but they, But they are like the the delicious. They're a delicious yeah, option the for the, the pine nut. Which is, okay, so I know that you said you need a, a thousand pine cones. But it is no, like. No, no, I said I have 1,500 pine trees. Oh, pine trees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I thought you said pine. Because it is much the smaller. Yeah, I've got all these pine trees. Yeah, like it is, it's, it's substantially smaller than the pine nuts. But when you buy a bag of pine nuts, it's like oh, 50 yeah. bucks. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is one of the, the things where you really are getting the bang for your buck out of it. And they're really good for you. And then I did want to say, because we're a very gluten intolerant society. So actually, one of the best, like, gluten free flowers that you can get your hands on is if you take white oak acorns and then you blanch them and then you can make that into a flower and it is a, it's amazing that's what bannock when we read about yeah. historical bannock was made out of it. <laughs> then i put in helpful plants so witch hazel is astringent it's great for insect bites homemade facial toner which i do make and it relieves itchiness and then wild growth of tea is a natural soother also very high in vitamin c and then the seeds of the myrrh high in vitamin e and then, Caroline can't get this to go. There we go. Okay, so clay and loam plants, berries and fruit. You have elderberries, wild raspberries, wild plum, pawpaw, currant, wild strawberries, not on the list, <laughs> leafy greens, uh, wild leek or ranch, which I do want to say is like. 
you guys can chime in on this as well, but like effectively, I, I'm a big fan of saying, eat your garlic mustard, leave the ramp. Like, yeah. we're, like I grow them in my garden. Yeah. I do not harvest them from my wood lot. You can eat, like I have it over here, invasive edibles. Eat autumn olive, garlic mustard, and dandelion. And there's some amazing, like the dandelion, you can eat the roots. You can, like, I do not ever recommend propagating these plants, but they are out there and a good way to get them under control is by eating them. So you, like I said, you can make that amazing pesto. Is that autumn olive? Is that was planted by the CA? Is that another? Yeah. yeah. Is that another one? Because I see that come at Longwood. Is that what they often call Russian olive? No, no that's a different that's one. Different. No. Because I no. made jam out of that. That's the Russian yeah. olive berries, but that's not what I don't know. Autumn olive has like these these uh, red berries. You can really see it in the fall, oh. and it usually is like because most of the people that had it on their land have cut it down. So you'll see it in the like ditches and rights away. And it's very, so on it, because there's actually like Superdia canadensis, which isn't on this list, it grows in sand. And you could confuse the two, which is, then makes, what is it, Indian ice cream is what it was called? Yeah. Where you'd make out of Superdia. Yeah. And, but this one has on, it, on the, the stem of it, there's a bunch of like uh, lenticels. And it's very, it's very easy to identify once you get your hands on it. So that's Super high in antioxidants. It sounds a lot like the Russian olive or the it's Russian olive. Different species of the same gene. Oh, yeah. Same yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Same gene. Yeah. So. And there is actually a native L like 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 Nances, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cuminuta, yeah. silver bell. Yeah. I, I have that growing. It's a stunning yeah. like native plant that doesn't look like a native plant. Oh my God, I love the foliage. I love it. It's hard to get. Well, I do as yeah. well. But uh, for me, my biggest incentive is yeah. I want to get it into the gardens of people who do not care. And the easiest way is to not sell them on the ecology is to sell them on the appearance of it because. Otherwise, they would have jumped on board, right. and they would be like, they would have already known Larry. <laughs> can, I, can I just comment on this? Because yeah. I, I love the fact that you brought in invasive edibles. Yes. Because because last year, I was like discovering all the things we could eat that, for example, Japanese knotweed. Yep. You know, my family's been trying to get rid of that for right. 72 years yep. on our farm, and that last year I found out I can eat it, and so I almost ate it gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, yeah. and it keeps coming up, but you just keep eating it, and you just yeah. keep eating it, and then, well, you know, it's not like the same as going to have to hoe it out. Mm -hmm. When you're going to get dinner, it's a little bit more Yeah, it's yeah, 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 right. So, like, you're getting this, so, uh, like, we, and, and milkweed, we weed the milkweed shoes, we make the milkweed flower clusters, oh, we eat the milkweed pods. I didn't know you could eat milkweed. <clears throat> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We're eating all that, so we're eating the milkweed weeds, and that's, that's because we have thousands of them, you know? Yeah. I know we need milkweed. Because, <laughs> like, chickweed, uh, our agricultural chickweed. That's really good. That's very good. Yeah. And that's it, another invasive. And then what's the one, like, they say that you have to plant it. You, I think it was you that told me it has a parasite if you eat it raw, but the watercress. Oh, I didn't say that. Oh, somebody was telling me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you? Why is this John Lammy? <laughs> anyway, but anyway. No, but it's just kind of interesting that you can eat these weeds. Yeah, like, and so if you are, okay, grow these things if you buy them and you put them in your garden. Is what I would recommend, and then you, and this, it's better than I am totally down with people gardening. But so many people get into gardening, they spend all this money on it, they end up with 25 tomato plants they didn't realize, and now they have to start canning. And then you think about it, it was grown in a greenhouse and with Miracle Grow and all those fertilizer inputs, and then at the end of the year, it's like, oh, we have too many tomatoes, we're just going to let it rot. Like if you're going to get into gardening and you kind of want to be lazy about it, native plant garden. Yeah. Because then when you get lazy, you feed the birds. You yeah, know, it has this like yeah. this uh, this whole circular economy that goes with it. And as you can see, there's an abundance. Like, so you have your wild leaf and ramps, which is actually really nice. Like in the garden, you put it out with some blood root, and it yeah. <laughs> it just looks really pretty. Um, and then ostrich burn for your fiddleheads. These these two specifically, please do not forage. Just don't forage them. Like there, they, they, it just is not. Please don't. There's not enough of them out there. Gray-headed coneflower grows like a weed, reseeds, and then you can eat it like spinach. Like, I know, I know, you can eat, like, these natives, they literally live here forever, and they, they just, they ate all this stuff. It's not that they were going to McDonald's, you know? Um, so hickory, delicious pecans, although I've never, ever, honestly, been able to eat one. The squirrels get them so bad, like, it, like but apparently you can eat They're them. They're really delicious. Like, um, and then black walnut. Hazelnut, and, and that list can go on and on and on. I just kind of kept it simple, and then back to eating the invasive edibles. So I have my last slide. Oh. Yeah, I, I, sure. I have thousands of raspberries, but I don't get any raspberries because yeah. there's, you know, there's way more 
Well, so if you do want your raspberries to produce more abundantly, they have two two different kinds of stalks on them, and they're going to produce off of like last year's stalks. So you have to go through and trim them. So what I've told people, like, because I I'm all about lazy gardening, like as little effort as possible. So you should um, hit like a section of it with a whipper snipper and then not hit the next section and then hit a section with the whipper snipper. So the the one that comes back after the whipper snipper hit is gonna be the one that produces the raspberry for you. So you're gonna like natural stands of raspberries don't produce as abundantly without <laughs> the management. You say you have <laughs> hundreds of raspberry plants? Well, thousands. So, and you're still you're not getting free? No, no. But, I'm on the edge of the woods too, right? Yeah, that's the same at our farm. We got buckets full last year. Yeah. Is it really shaded? Never done. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of berries, but in the time they're ready, they're they're You need to get like an owl. And then like an owl. Like a predator. Feed the coyotes. You know, I feed the coyotes all the time. <laughs> They're my favorite. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. <coughs> so native plants and abundant food source that is key to food sustainability. When you choose these crops, you not only have fresh local foods, but you also promote healthy ecosystems. Our ecosystems are very fragile and can be viewed as a house of cards in terms of delicacy, and there is definitely pun intended in there. <laughs> um, when you choose native plants, you can tap into the vastly connected network and make numerous positive impacts with only one choice. Native wild edibles have an incredibly low footprint. They require less nutrients, care, and water, and provide you with a healthier crop. That is all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah. Really <laughs> I haven't, been, I haven't been, been a lot more time talking about that, actually. Right? <laughs> Bedford native plants. Okay. Do you do your do you do your own like greenhouse kind of ideas? That sort of we have a hoop house. We do some propagating. I do. I'm so ashamed of it, but I do endangered species act permit request, which means that I destroy habitat with my brain. But we dig up plants yeah. on the, the spots that get destroyed. Okay. And then that's the majority of what we grow. We do a little bit by seed. Otherwise, we go to places like Amjian. We buy one-year plugs, and then we plant them up. Okay. I'll introduce Larry. So Larry is a retired certified conservationist horticulturalist and naturalist. He is passionate about all things nature, and he shares that passion in every presentation. He has received many awards from naturalists and conservationist groups, including... St. Clair Conservation, Ontario Nature, uh, Carolina in Canada, and the MNRF, and more. Larry has recently moved to the family farm, uh, Honey Locust Homestead, near Wallaceburg, Ontario, on the Sydenham River, with his wife Wendy and his daughter Becky and son in law Nick. Is there more trees that you're in? No. <laughs> Why did you ask? Why did you ask that, actually? Well, because they spin down by the oh. and there's some huge sycamores there, they get really hollow, they look like they're Yeah, so um, I put a few slides together. I was told to help up, talk about who I am a bit and then about, about native, naturalized landscaping with native plants and that sort of thing. So I've titled this, and I've only have 10 slides, Integrating Ecological Function into Your Home Landscape. And to me, that's the, the basic principle of what we're here to talk about, okay? But it's so much more than that, beyond that. Um, so yeah, I, I live in a log um, <laughs> with fairies and, you know, uh, leprechauns and ants and and millipedes and sawbugs and microbes of fungi. And I said to my wife, I'm going to say that too. Well, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. Like, so anyways, um, yeah, and, and I... I really love trees and everything about nature. So um, if we'll go to the next slide. You went a whole bunch of slides. <laughs> okay, next slide. Yeah, and so um, I'm past president of Lambton Wildlife in Sarnia and, and four times past president of the St. Antille Naturalist in, in Wallaceburg area. 
And so for 25 years now, it's actually 35 years that I've been, I've been on the board of SFN for 35 years. <laughs> and um, so I've been leading walks and giving talks and doing tours and all that kind of thing. Sitting like, them naturally. Sitting them feel naturally. Okay. Yeah. And um, so here's just a couple of images of, of me out on, uh, on tours and we're talking about prairie and we're talking about forests and old growth trees and that sort of thing. And, and so I just love to get out and, and share that information with people, get people excited about trees. Oh, I can do it myself. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> about trees and that. This is weird having that camera right in front of me. <laughs> and that I'm sitting down is a little different too. But anyway, um, yeah, just, just that... Um, I've been involved with both of the clubs for, for decades, and um, it's been a, been a real pleasure. And it's it's really made me who I am, the involvement with those clubs. The, the, our family farm was the original seed of making me who I am, because we have the same that river on the back of the farm. And, um, you know, I, I did everything in that river, and, and I fished. And, and it just everything about nature kind of came from that experience of having a, a farm in the family, right? I was actually born in Sarnia, but I spent most of my time at the family farm. Um, how does this work? Just the, the side button. Yeah. That's what I was doing. Oh, now I want you. Can you put it back? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so... Um, the squirrel wants to be on film. Yeah. Can you make it go back? Where, where are we supposed to point? Yeah. Oh, point oh, that at Point it at that thing? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, so sharing the wonders about nature, and and um, th that's at the Lawrence Sea Conservation Anderson, where I'm holding that large sycamore leaf. Mm -hmm. That's that's a biggie, right? Look at the size of that leaf. What? Where did you say you were there? Lawrence Sea Henderson at Petrolia, it's conservation story property there near Petrolia, oh, it's just um, west of Petrolia. And in the other image, it's just of me planting a tree, and and I just tell people like, get out and plant trees. And you'll go to bed that night feeling so good that you did something for nature, you know, and just the experience of all these things. And and, and, and that's the main message is get outside. Okay, get outside. Mm -hmm. Get grounded. Get outside. Okay, Where did you get that tree from? The tree I'm planting there? Yeah. Like a conservation, that's a pretty big tree. No, I got that from Heavenly Earth. Oh, yeah. Heavenly Earth. Yeah. And um, there was a request. If there's questions, if you could repeat it for people on the oh, right. right. You can't hear the question. The question was, where did I get that tree I was planting? And I said it came from Heavenly Earth, which is a native plant nursery near Bothwell. Okay, we'll be probably mentioning that later. Yeah. And, um, and of course, the, the children, right? Like in today's technical world where they're, you know, they're all going to have carpal tunnel, tunnel by the time they're 20, um, you know, with their... their Technology. Um, we got We got to get the kids outside. We got to talk to them. We got to share with them, and um, hopefully we can start to get them to um, to enjoy that sort of thing. And then, you know, this is what I've been doing for like 25 years now. I started landscaping in the Groot style. You know, traditional. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, <laughs> traditional landscaping. And um, <clears throat> but my my um, experience with the Naxos Club. And learning from people and, and getting deeper into it, all of a sudden it was like, no, this all has to be for nature, what I'm doing. And, and so that just turned into natural landscapes using native plants, okay? And, and that's been my focus oh, for a long time now. Is that your garden? No, that's um, um, Kathy and Kirk Mitchell's garden that I helped them, de I designed it and built it for them, yeah. Beautiful. And, um, and it's, it's all, to me, it's all about inviting nature into your life, okay? Um, nature and all their wonderful beings, you know, like this, this eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly and that, that sweat bee there. Um, the butterfly is on a, um, it's on a cup plant and the, um, and the bee's on an iron weed. Um, so inviting that to your home, to your, your experience too. This is about experience and relationship. This is what this becomes about. As as you as you experience it, you're just gonna get hooked. Like you and, and it really brings to you <coughs> the changes and things like that, you know, of, of 
when you're going to see the first bumblebee, when you're going to see the first sweat bee, when you're going to see the first, like, all of a sudden you start to take these things in, you know. I love this time of year, you know, like, my, my wife's birthday is February 28th, and I guarantee her, I guarantee her, killdeers, robins, yeah. and red-winged blackbirds and swans by her birthday on February 28th. Now, how many people know that? Well, I do because I heard the yeah. yeah. My birthday is February 27th. <laughs> but, you know, like, and that's why I go back to it, to the indigenous culture and the indigenous people. That meant something to them when they saw those first swans, when they saw, heard that first robin. They know I better tap my maple tree, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and I got to start thinking this, and I know the more mother. So we lost connection to those kinds of things, and I feel that when you have an, a natural landscape that you're engaged in, <clears throat> you become in tune with that kind of stuff again, the with nature. Moon, the full moon that we just had, yeah. also known as like the maple moon, the black moon, oh, yeah, and yeah, the yeah. crunchy snow moon. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've read the crunchy snow moon thing before. I did moon water for it. And and then you know like you start to discover you really start to discover what a little a little bit of landscape the big difference it can really make you know and all of a sudden you have these stories you can tell people and and when we first did this so I was involved with a, a program called, program called Return the Landscape but I did naturalized landscaping on my own for for many years um, and the joy that you get from when you, when a customer you know, called you on the phone because, oh, my God, I just had this in my yard, you know, like for the first time in their lives, you know. We had so many of those stories. We have, I remember I had one customer, they were into toads. Like, they just loved toads. And you went in the house, and there was, like, toad ornaments and toad pictures. And, and um, we, I did a whole landscape design for them. There's hardly any lawn left, maybe less than half. And um, about the third day after I was done, I got a phone call. Oh, my God, we got a toad. We have a toad in our yard. Yeah. And I said, well, that's great. You know, obviously, he couldn't come to your yard before because it was lawn corner to corner. And you would have chopped him up into pieces with your lawnmower. So, um, and then, you know, like, we have so many birds in there. We don't even know what they are. You know, like, so people are start to learn and discover these kinds of things, you know. Discovering a, a bird nest in your yard. You know, and I don't know if we're going to get to talk about what it takes to have baby birds in your yard. We, we might be able to get to that, but it takes a lot and it takes native plants. Okay. And we'll talk about that. Or like I've had numerous experiences with hummingbirds now. Cause you know, hummingbird? yeah, it's a hummingbird. And so, you know, I'm sitting in the garden and I'm doing something and all of a sudden I hear this, you know, and I'm looking and here's this hummingbird right beside me or between my legs, you know, and hummingbird doesn't care I'm there. And I have the same thing with bumblebees. You know, my daughter and I, we love petting bumblebees. You know, they get so busy with the neck. You can pet bumblebees, you know, and things like that. And those experiences start to draw you in more to what you're doing. Um, well, and native plants, but I tell you, when we did it, it it's, it's phenomenal how busy. It is phenomenal. Those plants are, because they are covered all the time. Yeah with many different types of bees too, yeah. And usually when, when people come to me or to somebody who does native landscaping, um, they, they know they want to connect with nature and they know they want to help the bees or, or help the butterflies, monarchs in particular, right? Everybody wants to help the monarchs. Um, and, and it's generally like, well, you go and they, well, they have a totally sunny site or they have a totally shady site, so you're like either looking at a, at a a prairie meadow where you're looking at a woodland shade garden, um, which are both wonderful, but there's there's a lot of things in between that that sphere of, of types of things you can do in your yard. I was just at a conference at MSU yesterday, or this weekend, I should say, um, and these, these, these people got an award and, and, a, and a financial grant for doing this garden they did, and it was a, a, it was a, a sand dune beach garden. And you should have seen the pictures of it. I mean, it was rolling sand, and there was, there was like you know the beach grass, including long reed, and and, and then there was like um, rough blazing star and butterfly milkweed, but not very many. It was basically mostly sand. And and I did that once for somebody. I did a little ten foot, twelve foot section of their garden, like it was you know the, the prairie meadows, first. and then I did a beach thing, and then we went into the under a tree where we got into a, a shade garden. And the nice thing about those beach sand gardens is you don't have to weed them. Yeah. 
because no, seeds won't germinate on the surface of sand, you know, like, so your weeding problem's done. Um, Sean McKnight, who, who helped started RTL with me, he had a beautiful sand dune in his front yard in Sarnia, beautiful sand dune. So those are kind of cool. And then there's things like, you know, moss, moss and fern gardens, rain gardens. I mean, there's just so many opportunities to do a lot of different things. Um, and on the other hand, your goal is ecological function, okay? So, you know, like, the plant collector in you, you know, the I have to have HTA, you know, like HTA. Really, if we get talking about it, there's certain plants that do a lot more, have a lot more impact, and help a lot more um, wildlife species than others, even within the realms of native plants. Yeah. So that's something to consider too. How much room do you have? How much are you concerned about biodiversity? Uh, or is there something in particular you'd like to help or attract those kinds of things, right? So that's just an image of a, of a, a meadow and a, and a shade garden. And the, the other thing about this is that once you start really getting into and, and, and feeling what's going on in that garden, it becomes therapy, okay? Like put a chair in there, get a chair in there somewhere, and just sit there and let those plants talk to you and let the bees and the birds come and sit beside you. And this is therapy. And, and I'll tell you, our culture needs this big time. Our children need this big time. They need to get into a backyard. You don't have to go to this Great Smokies Mountain National Park. You don't have to all go to Algonquin Park. You can do it in your backyard, okay? So that's a big thing about this. And, and people feel it. Like, you spend a couple hours in there and you're better for like two or three days. You should do it every day, but it'll help you for two or three days. You you will sleep better at night. Yeah. Um, so these are two customers I had, and and they just love sitting in their gardens and, and and with the daughter there. That's pretty cool, right? So inviting nature into your lives. It's about relationship. Um, that's my friend's Paul's on the left, and that was my previous garden that I had on the right in Wallsburg. Um, and the question is, what's in your backyard? Okay. So that was. 10 slides and just kind of touched on a bunch of things, but um, we'll go from there. Thank you. If I can add something to the later yeah, presentation, yeah. When, when I got started in this, I, do you remember the days like when we met, it was in that sale in Sarnia? Yeah. And I bought all these plants, it was in downtown Sarnia, and I was yep. getting into native plant gardening. I had also worked at, at a nursery. I was doing forestry. I found all of these non-native plants in Woodlots and I converted. And um, and so anyways, I pack, I had a Honda Civic, just packed it full. And my dad had this spot for me next to his chemical storage behind the barn. And so I'm like pulling this stuff out. And as I'm pulling these plants out, like butterflies are just like, boom, they're just coming. And so like after that, I made the motto of our company, we bring the butterflies. Oh, cool. Because and, like it just, it was instant. The second that I was pulling these plants out, because you had selected them. And yeah, yeah. Them this kind of <laughs> and anyways, it was just, it was an instant impact. And there's like all of this like, farm chemical off to one side and it didn't like they didn't care they just didn't go over there they just stayed with it but that's my first knowing of of uh larry and you changed the whole trajectory like, that hey. reminds me of a little can i say a little story quickly here so that, probably at that plant sale but one of those in downtown Sarnia, you know and um and we had a whole bunch of trees to sell and um we had a few hop trees to sell okay and so i've got this lady here and she's like well, why would I want that? You know, and I said, well, this is the only plant. This, did you know that this is a citrus family plant that you can grow here in, in Sarnia? She goes, really? I said, yeah. And it's the only citrus family tree we have. And it's the only tree that the giant swallowtail butterfly caterpillar can eat. The only one. Hop tree? Hop tree. Hop tree. Uh -huh. Tulea like trifoliata. Yeah. Tree, um, tulea <laughs> trifoliata. Um, so as I'm trying to convince her about, you know, the wonders of nature and how this works out, we're standing on Davis Street, right? Standing up, and I look down the street while I'm talking to her, and here comes a giant swallowtail. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm talking to her, and it's getting closer, and it's getting closer, and I stop, and I said, here's a giant swallowtail. And it came, and it landed on the hop tree right in front of us, and it laid an egg, it moved, it laid another egg, and it went on, and the lady went, oh, my God, I'll take all three of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like she was hooked right there, you know. And that's that experience, right? Yeah, and what's really cool is when you get to see those caterpillars. <laughs> so my sister-in-law in Cern, yeah, has a butterfly card. Yeah. And she, like, beautiful. And she gave me a hop tree. Huh? So I planted it so I could see it out my window. And I'm out working on my 
my garden one day and I looked up and it's loaded with larvae. Huh? So I took them all into her and she asked them all at once. Oh, cool. And I took her 11 and she asked 10. Wow. Now that tree grow in probably, see, we live in clay. Right. I've grown it in clay. Exactly. I, yeah. Like, oh, you need like, oh, no, I think that's it. No, I've grown it in clay. Yes, I think it will. Oh. I don't like sandy low, but I think it will. It definitely grows in clay. I've grown many in clay. Yeah. I had one at that, that garden I showed you there um, in Wallsburg. Literally in its second year, it grew nine feet yeah. on clay. Yeah, like, it just went crazy. It was like weird. That's so exciting. Is that with a B or a P? Oh. Hops. 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 Yeah, you tell me. I, I know. I, I, I didn't want to say that you're wrong, but it's, yeah. it's, I don't use that language, but it's, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I can't. Sorry. Do you have a question mark? No, mine was about eight feet tall. Oh, yeah. Because okay. yeah. I think it's 13 meters. Yeah. It's a. Uh, yeah. It's actually the perfect patio tree, if I may say so. Oh. Everybody's got to have a hop tree, really. <laughs> Three of them. Never plant one of anything, at least three. Yeah, I do that in a box. Pardon? In a box? No, no, just at the edge of the patio. They make nice little shade, little trees. They never get big. They'll never put roots in, under your foundation. Like, they're perfect little trees. Oh, it's not bad. I never heard of these ones. I know. It's very rare. Well, they're very rare. They're very rare. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think she bought it from uh, Heavenly Earth. Heavenly Earth? Or the one that's there? Um, Well, we've had them in a number, number of different nurseries, which we'll talk about later. So. Yeah. Yeah. They're easy to grow. Yeah. In fact, they feed themselves once you have them, even on clay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our final panelist, uh, Mike Smith, is a dedicated environmentalist and the founder of Relief Chatham Kent, an organization that is dedicated to preserving natural habitat and promoting the importance of native plant gardening in their community. Mike is also the current president of the Sydney Hanfield Naturalist and brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to his work with an associate diploma in environmental management from the University of Guelph and another in multimedia design from Humber College. As an engineer technologist, he specializes in GIS, cartology, cartography, and spatial analyst, and as an avid native plant gardener, hiker, bird watcher, and lover of trees. And I'll let you go into more detail about reasons. Thank you very much. Um, so I just have a few slides here to talk about uh, Relief and Sitting in Field Naturalist. Go on to the next slide whenever you're ready. Okay, so um, I started Relief in uh, 2019. Um, and basically I started it to document the process of naturalizing a property that I purchased out in North Buxton. And I decided to move, actually, immediately after meeting Larry for the first time and uh, seeing, seeing him speak at a Lower Thames uh, workshop. Um, and Larry gave a presentation on native plants and their importance to the, importance to the environment. And I was immediately, like, hooked, obviously. Everybody knows here. But <laughs> now Larry's a great presenter. Um, so I went home. I was living in Chatham at the time. I had a tiny little yard. It was about a tenth of an acre. And I went home and I ripped out all the non-native plants that were in there. And I went to Om Janong and a bunch of different other places. I had filled up the backyard and the front yard within about two weeks. And I thought, okay, this is not nearly enough space to do <laughs> what I want to do. So um, that was June. And then by September, we had moved out here to an acre. Um, and when we got it, it was just grass. There was like literally not a, not a tree on it. Um, so I worked with the Conservation Authority to plant 800 trees the first year. Um, and how, many, uh, how big of a plant? About one acre. So 1.15, but close enough. Um, so that first year planted 800 trees, and since I probably planted about 200 more, um, and then sort of just kind of took my foot off the lawnmower pedal and let things sort of come back, um, focus on removing the invasive things that popped up, but just sort of let it nature take its course, and that picture is from 
the summer of 2020. So that's the essentially the first summer after putting the lawnmower away. And all that white bit that you can see in there is that, that the native aster that came up and it was already there, right, in the seed bank just waiting for me to not mow it over. So um, Relief has 1,200 members now on Facebook and just about the same number on Instagram. So social media following is pretty strong. Um, and basically the group is around to help people get going on this stuff. So um, talk about, you know, I've got a empty spot. What can I put there? There's lots of people in the group that chime in and answer questions. Next slide. So um, one of the things that I am most proud of, um, in addition to the fundraising and stuff that Relief has done, um, is we were successful in getting a bylaw changed, actually. So in uh, Chatham-Kent, prior to the summer of 2021, um, the long grass and weeds bylaw basically said that any vegetation did not specify grows more than 20 centimeters and someone calls and complains about it, you are to cut it down within three days. Um, it didn't matter if it was native or non-native, there was no distinction, it didn't matter even if you were who you were, like you could be driving past on the road and see something that you didn't like the look of and call public works and say, I don't like that, it looks scrubby, and they would say, oh, cool, all right, it's gone, whoever, whoever owns it's got three days to take care of it. Um, so that was obviously causing problems for folks like myself who basically wanted native things to be growing higher than 20 centimeters all over my property. Um, and also in talking with the conservation authorities, um, they had had some troubles with like actual tall grass prairie installations that had been you know, thousands of dollars of tall grass prairie seed that had been subject to that exact practice. If someone had called and said, I don't know what this is, I don't know what it looks like, get rid of it. So um, I worked with a, my local counselor in Ward 2 in Chatham and we got a motion in front of council and we got a report and we got the bylaw changed. So, that was Chatham Kent. That's correct. It was Chatham Kent only right now, yeah. So are you gonna try and broadcast that so other people can pick up the work that you've done and then challenge their For sure, yeah. I've actually helped a couple of different groups to sort yeah. of get that going and if you're interested I'd be happy yeah. to chat. Um, but yeah, basically now what happens is if you want to attempt a naturalization project on your property, you call the city, they direct you to public works, and public works will send an inspector out to your property and you have to meet two criteria. So you have to have naturally occurring populations of native species, and you have to have planted, intentionally planted native species. So sort of a catch-22, because if you have just planted them and there's nothing there, then you sort of have to wait for those that you've planted to become naturally occurring in order to meet the criteria. Um, but really, that's it. Once you've met those two checkboxes and the public works supervisor says you're good to go, Anybody that calls about your property, they'll say, yeah, okay, well, roll 1234 actually has a naturalization exemption and they're allowed to do whatever they want there. So, um, to me, that was a really big win, obviously not just for me personally, <laughs> but um, just because, you know, like now there's people who want to do this can't run into essentially an a, a, a ignorant neighbor that doesn't know any better and can, you know, destroy their project without knowing any better. So, um, that was a big win a couple years ago. Um, and if you want to go on to the next slide, I've got a couple more things to talk about for release. Um, we okay. do. Is that the next slide? Yep. <laughs> Somebody else is doing it. Yeah, you're good. Um, we do host a number of events uh, throughout the year. I'll just talk about a few of them here. Uh, tree cycle is something that we do a couple times a year. And basically, the idea there is that I think everybody's probably mowed over a tree or two in the lawn when you're cutting the grass. For me personally, it was silver maples. I had a few silver maples at home. and they self-seed rather prolifically, and I was mowing them down every time I was cutting the grass around the house. And I thought, I mean, maybe somebody wants these baby silver maples that I don't want. Um, so basically what we do is we have people gather up the unwanted native trees that you have around the house, and we have a depot in North Buxton where you bring them twice a year, and usually I'm there for a Saturday or Sunday. You come and you drop off the stuff that you don't want, and you can then take stuff that's been dropped off. So it's kind of like a tree swap or a tree... That's through really that's through this. Yep. Um, so that's been quite successful. Um, you know, people bring their silver maples and they leave with oaks, or they bring their cedars and they leave with tulip trees, or whatever it may be. Um, and then we do native tree and shrub auctions as well. So I'll go out and find some folks to usually donate some native trees, and then we put them in the group and people bid, and then the proceeds will go to a conservation authority generally. Uh, we do seed collection in the fall, so I teach people how to collect and store native plant seed. 
Uh, we've helped the municipality and some conservation authorities with removing invasive species on their property, and we do uh, tree planting as well for like, volunteer efforts. Next slide. Yeah, in the middle. I live in Sycamore. That's cool. Oh, okay. I have one of those in my yard. It's got to be about 40 feet tall. Really nice. One of my favorite native trees. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful woods. Oh, it's in the world of native edibles. Do you just mind reiterating that you're talking about the data together? Sorry, yeah, tulip tree is the seed in the center there that they're circling from us. How long does it take before you get? How long does it take before you get? Typically, it's pretty long, like 15 years before oh, they start. Oh, no, I've had some that we planted from the CA. They, uh, at the some, largest, they were human height. Human height, six feet high, two meters. Yeah, whiffs, and, and they're already producing. Is it in full sun? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, but it's, it, it's small. And it's they do, the, the flowers are behind the foliage. So you do got to look out for it. It's not going to be like, it's not like a magnolia where it blooms in advance right. of the, it, it's a magnolia day, but. Um, the leaves come first. Yeah, and the, the bloom is like tucked in behind them. You're, it's not going to be this like on the outside of it. Well, they're big though. They're big flowers. Yeah. They're two of the size flowers. Mine are 12 years old. So have they? Yeah. But how yeah. big was this? Like I was talking about from the seed, right? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's going to take 15 years. 10 to 15 years in there somewhere. They are the fastest growing tree in North America. Yep. Like when a, if there's a blowdown in, in a forest cover and there's tulip tree seedling, in 30 years they will be the tallest tree in the forest. Yeah, they'll they catch up. germinate easily too. Like yeah. they're really easy to germinate. Well, they're big though, are they not? They're softwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, softwood. Like ice storms are tough on them. Um, but plant them anyway. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's dangerous. It's down. It's dangerous. That's why I cut down because branches cut down. Well, they're not usually big yeah, branches. Honestly, but a branch that falls off of an oak is going to go through the top of your house. It might be a stronger tree, but that's like a. 100 pound branch yeah. versus the tulip tree is like, oh, it's a 30 pound branch, it's gonna bounce. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, yeah. Uh, just gonna keep fudging on here. No <laughs> problem. Um, the other organization I want to talk about is Sydenham Field Naturalist, um, and I'm gonna let Larry take some of these. Um, but as I think Larry mentioned in his intro, we're coming up on 40 years of uh, <coughs> being steward, and property stewards and educating people and advocating for nature in. Uh, Wallsburg area, so almost four years in 1986, I think. 85. 85. Um, Chatham Cantonese Nationalist Club. Uh, I'm the current president. Um, Larry's the past president. And uh, we'll just pull items here about SFN. There you go, Larry. Yeah, so, um, you know, as, as all nationalist clubs, it kind of starts out with um, people who love nature and they want to go bird watching together or, you know, go for hikes, walks together. And, and, and over the 40 years, um, almost 40 years. And the same thing with Lambton Wildlife. Lambton Wildlife started it in 66, so they're like 57 years now. Um, over the years, um, ecology starts to really, you know, play into the picture, and, and the clubs kind of evolve into more environmental and conservation-oriented, um, not-for-profit um, charitable organizations. And so we're really, really, really proud of both of these clubs and the properties the ecologically significant properties that we have protected over the last couple of decades, like it, it's, it's just so heartwarming to know that this is happening, and it's happening because of volunteer clubs with volunteer members. And I always try to impress that on people. If there wasn't members, there would be no Sydney Field Naturalist Club. And all of these things we've done and are continuing to do would not happen if there was no Sydney Field Naturalist Club or no Lampton Wildlife Club without membership. So if you can't go out there and do these things yourself, if you can't save a 200-acre ecologically significant woodland, help somebody that does. Give them a bit of money. Support them. Support them with restoration work, too, if they have to do some of that later. Um, so, so our history has really evolved from going bird watching and having fun and picnics to really getting serious about conservation and protection of our significant habitats we have in Chatham, Canton, Lambton County. 
so yeah, in addition to stewardship, we also do all kinds of advocacy action. Um, so we land acquisition and educate people on habitat quality and basic species removal, and we comment on different things when asked in the media. Um, so again, basically Chatham Kent's only sort of nature focused club, and if you're interested, we would love to have you join. So before we guess, get into the panel discussion, do you want to take any questions about either one of the clubs that I just mentioned? or Are you located in Chatham or here? Uh, Relief is Chatham Kent focused. Sydney Hanfield Naturalist is sort of based in Wallsburg, but also we say we're Chatham Kent. Yeah, Chatham Nature yeah. Club. Yeah. yeah. Our meetings are between Wallsburg and Chatham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention we are coming up uh, on the hour. So if anybody does have to go, we are recording it. Uh, but obviously, an hour is not enough. To <laughs> make everyone, you know, everything we discussed, right? There's so many different things to discuss. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we just wanted to like thank you for your presentation. So obviously, you guys have a wealth of knowledge and to limit yourself to you know 10 to 15 minutes is difficult with everything you do. Um, but because we want to make this, you know. We're converting, right? These are the people here that we want to convert. Uh, but the best way to convert <laughs> is to start small sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a beginner, could you guys list, you know, three or four species that they could plant in their yard that would be a, a proven winner, right? That's a that's a, a word you always see. These are proven winners. But what's the what's the species that you know someone could get this spring and plant in the yard? And within a year or two, see you know good results. Who wants to start? Okay. I go, we go reverse. Yeah, go reverse. All right. Yeah. <laughs> good. All right. So I actually have five. Uh, I'm going to start with Lansley's coreopsis. Um, it is bright yellow. Um, it is easy to grow from seed. It doesn't require any stratification. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll it. Exactly. It self seeds <laughs> plentifully. If you deadhead it, it will bloom for a month and a half, almost two months probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really bright, um, pop of color. Uh, next one would be, oh, sorry? Was it Coryopsis? Yes, Lance Leaf Coryopsis. Does it have to be Lance Leaf? Lance Leaf Coryopsis. Any, any of the native Coryopsis are winners, but the, the kind of the characteristics of the re-blooming will be specific to Lance Leaf. For sure. how, do you know, how do you know if it's native or not? Because I have Coryopsis, I've had three varieties of flowers. How do I know if it's native or not? Just download and pass. They're pretty buy good at this stage. Buy it from a native plant nursery. Yeah, like by where you <laughs> buy from, it's going to be. But if you want to identify the one that you have, I highly recommend using that. For sure. <laughs> uh, second one, probably the most common, wild bird moss. Everybody's probably familiar with wild bird moss. Purple, butterfly, bees, both love it. You can make tea out of it. You can make tea out of it. Other leaves. Yeah, yeah. Throw in your salad. Venarda, yeah, there's any name of it. Yeah, good call. Um, I have number three, for that. I'm going to say arrow leaves aster, uh, really good in a woodland garden, um, makes nice little sort of pyramidal shaped columns, really nice white flowers in the fall, blooms for a long time. Uh, four, stiff leaves goldenrod, um, probably my favorite goldenrod, it has really nice compact um, heads. And my last one I'm going to say wild ginger, it's oh, a shade nice. ground cover. And is not edible. Correct. It smells very edible. It don't need it. Mike, can you just repeat them? Yes. Uh, I will re I'll repeat them slowly, yes. Lance leaf coreopsis, wild bergamot, arrow leaves aster, stiff leaves goldenrod, and wild ginger. It is just nice green, uh, uh, shiny color. Yes. Yeah. That's the goldenrod, what's the name? Stiff leaves. Stiff, C-I-T? Stiff, S-T-I-F-F. Stiff leaves. And they look so different than your Canadian goldenrod. Like you, like you feel like you can just push down them. Like there's a cluster at the top of them. That's the ones that are in the ditch. That Canadian is very common. It's a type of goldenrod. There's like 150 different types of goldenrod and even more of asters. Like there's lots of so what's the difference as far as native and all these different varieties? Different varieties? So they're all, like Canada Goldenrod and the one that Mike has suggested are both native. Yeah. This is just what better behaved. 
Yes, that's a good way to say it. They're pretty too, actually. Because I had them in Milton, and I just was a river Texas. My dad had them in the corner, but just pull them out. Yeah. Well, now if you have them, you could go to Relay Chatham Kent and do it in the tree cycling. Mm-hmm. You're like, I have a bunch of Canada gold rod. Does somebody want it? <laughs> So my turn, yeah. So I'm kind of rethinking this a little bit, but, <laughs> um, but right off the bat, the the first two things that have to be on here are are golden rods <laughs> and asters. You know, so like now I could pick different golden rods and different golden aster species than Mike has, but basically we have like about a dozen well behaved, well behaved golden rods that are clump forming. They don't grow by rhizomes. You put Canada in, and your whole backyard is going to be Canada in five years, okay? But if you put in stiff, or you put in Riddell's, or if you put in gray, or if you put in showy, or blue, like, they're all clump forming, and they, and they will seed, but that's not as, that's not difficult to deal with compared to rhizomes coming up, because you can't tell what's going on underground, and they come up in your other plants, and then what do you do? So, goldenrod, I pick gray, because it's one of the shortest ones. I really like gray goldenrod. Really well behaved, and and just have a, a nice color, sky blue aster. Oh, that's so pretty. It's, yeah, very very pretty aster. And then next, I would go to to milkweeds. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, swamp would be my first pick because it's like chocolate. because it's well behaved. Also, it it grows as a clump. Beautiful flower. So does butterfly milkweed, um, and, and like poke and green. Like there's there's a few really nice ones that are pretty well behaved and. Um, um, poke you can grow in the shade, like under oak trees and stuff like that. What's that? Poke milkweed, P O K E, poke. Oh, I've, it, I've heard of poke weed, but it's poke weed. Poke milkweed. It's yeah. poke weed is poke milkweed. No, no, no. Oh. poke weed is poke weed and poke milkweed. No, is this is poke, milkweed. yeah, poke milkweed. And it's a white flower instead of a pink or mauvey colored one. It's re- so it's really pretty in a, in a shade garden. Um, and then to go a little bit further in the shade gardens, uh, wild geranium is a must. If you got oh, a shade yeah. garden, you have to have wild geranium. Good one, Larry. Not just for the beauty of it, but for the support of especially queen bumblebees in the spring. That's where the queen, the queens come out. They'll, they'll be coming out when the trilliums are going in the blood root, but they really cut going when the, when the, the geranium is starting to bloom when the trilliums are kind of finishing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you could, I've had individual plants of wild geranium that had, I counted, over a hundred flowers on one plant at, yeah, at once, blooming at once. Wild geranium. Is geranium. that in the shade? You... That's in the shade, but you can. They will take some sun. Oh, That's one God. that you can oh, push out, goodness. push out into the sun a bit. Especially if there's a moisture. If you can maintain a moisture level, they'll they'll handle sun. They won't burn in the sun like some shade things will. Oh. Um, and then another one that I really like, which is kind of. Another kind of shorter one. Oh, geez, the list gets longer, right? I know. But you didn't say this one. Virginia Mountain Mint. Yeah. Virginia Mountain Mint. I said Virginia one. Mountain Mint. We were told five. We were told five. That's right. We got at least five. That's six? Okay. Don't forget the blazing start. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I didn't just write down. I, I, I so, I appreciate that you're going for the nectar producing. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, I think that everyone that wants to start, like bring the butterflies, go for a spice bush. Yeah. If you plant a spice bush, you'll get a swallowtail. You'll be so proud. You'll be happy. Like butterfly, like reproducer, it's amazing. I also went with yarrow because it's a host of a couple of butterflies as well. Um, smells amazing. It like it's good for like stomach issues and stuff like that. It's also in the world of well-behaved native plants, you can hide this one as a non-native. Like, it just is really clump forming and the silver foliage looks amazing. What is it on the Yarrow. Yeah. Yarrow. Oh, yeah. And then, and that's specifically um, milliform. Like, there's there's some that come out, like, that strawberry one isn't native. It's the one with the white flowers, like, that is. Because this one does come up in the... In, so the other one is not native? Oh. <laughs> used to be white? Yeah. It used to be white. It's, yeah, yeah oh. milliform. Melformis, I think is his mm-hmm. botany. And then so, and then I am putting down purple flowering raspberry because in the world, it kills a lot of non-native plant people. And this one, like you, it's almost like a hydrangea. Like it, it, it has these magenta flowers on it. It blooms throughout the season. It is absolutely stunning. Has this really nice umbrella shape to it. You you really can throw it into a non-native plant garden and you would never even know these. Raspberry. It, okay. it, it, it actually makes a true bramble. Like what and so, but it doesn't taste very good. 
<laughs> this is about the flowers, trust me. Um, I, I wanted to say New England Aster because it's like a mm-hmm. mom. You can just deadhead it and it is just absolutely stunning. It is a little bit, it's not super well behaved, but in some places you can let it go. And then on, on because Larry didn't, I'm going to say Anna's Hit Off and Giant Yellow Hit Off because those two bring mm-hmm. your your police. Yeah, they, they attract Hornet. like the crazy well, and the, wasps. A lot of the wasps that are the parasitic wasps, and it brings the ladybugs and stuff like that. So, like, the police that you need in a vegetable garden that will take care of the pets and stuff like that, the hits off are really good. What is the that again? H-Y-S-S-O-P. H-Y-S-S-O-P, and there's anise and giant yellow. Um, and then for a tree. Can you slow down? Oh, I'm sorry. They don't have to uh, pretty slow into the microphone. Where's the mic? Well, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so Anis Hissoff. So A N I S E S A. Sorry, H Y S S O P. And Giant Yellow Hissoff is also another good one. And then for a tree, I know that oak has the most caterpillars, uh, but yeah. I'm going with Trembling Aspen because I like my the sound of privacy yeah. and not hearing your neighbors is fantastic if you live in an urban area. And a trembling aspen is so loud, you know, it just, it, it like, I, they did a study on, on privacy. It was at, at a forestry conference at the University of Toronto. And people always think that putting up that cedar hedge so that you don't see your neighbor is where privacy begins. But if you go to like Asian countries, they'll put up milky glass walls because they don't want to hear their neighbors. If they see lights coming from the other side of that milky glass wall, they don't care. So privacy, like, if you're thinking about any form of privacy, you should put a hedge in with a couple trembling aspens so you don't have to hear it and you don't have to see it. So, And it's the second caterpillar producer out of all the trees. It makes Larry happy. Thank you. That's way more than five, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I agree. Um, so I think just to keep us moving on as we get answers, uh, I'm going to direct this one to Mike because he has a stack of books. Good. It, was, it was mentioned at... Mm-hmm. Uh, and there is so much more information now available on phones and that. But what book is a great starter? What what book would you recommend for someone that's looking to transform their yard? So I just pick one. Okay. Um, if I'm gonna pick one, I'm gonna say a Lorraine Johnson book. So this is her new book. Uh, it's called The Garden for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. But I think she also has at least two more. Um, one is hundred easy to grow native plants, I believe. Um, Lorraine is like a rock star in the native plant garden world. This is um, really easy to digest. It's got tons of really accurate and uh, helpful information. Um, and again, if I'm picking one for beginners, that's what it is. Uh, Lor- yes, Lorraine Johnson. And the book is called A Garden for the Rusty Patched Bumblebee. Um, I'm going to throw a tough one at you, Larry. For people with less space, someone maybe growing an apartment or you know, a townhouse or whatnot, are there any plants or are there anything that they could do, you know, plants that would be well acceptable for putting in pots? or, you know, smaller spaces that would do well. So they can still, you know, create right. that, yeah. that right. little so, habitat, but they so may not have the, the backyard to convert. Right. Uh, um, small makes a big difference. A, small, a garden the size of this table can make a big difference, and you can have that experience with a, gar- with a garden the size of this table. Um, and I automatically go to when, when we're talking about, you know, confined space and small, um, th- I go back to thinking about supporting pollinators again. And, you know, you could even have just a, like, a, like a wine barrel kind of size pot and put five or six um, pollin- um, herbaceous prairie plants in there um, that would, I think, accomplish a lot and give you an experience that, that would speak to you as to being connected to nature a bit, focusing on the pollinators. Um, if, if we're talking about a yard, and it's just a small yard, um, then, then a, a hop tree or a service berry, some kind of small growing tree shrub, um, because really in the, in the caterpillar world, it's mostly about woody plants for caterpillars. Okay, and if, and if you get talking about caterpillars, um, supporting them, 
uh, then you're talking about supporting birds. Okay, so there, so if you can get a spot where you can get a small growing tree in, like a service barrier or a hop tree, um, that would be a, a good step in a, in a tiny small yard. You know, you don't have room for an oak kind of thing, right? Although I usually tell people, don't tell me you don't have room for an oak. You know, like I know, I know, yeah, you know, or a dwarf king. <laughs> I know people with like an acre, and they say, I don't. Have, I got ten trees. I said, ten trees. Like, I got a fifteen by fifteen foot triangle in their front yard. It's got ten trees. So, like, yeah. So that'd be my suggestion. Some little it's pollinator a thing in a pot, or or a small tree shrub. And if I can say something about in pots, like. Even something like the trembling aspen can grow in a pot for like yeah. mm -hmm. five, ten years, sure. right? So like it's it's you can grow <coughs> almost anything in a pot and keep it as an ornamental plant, and then when it grows out of size, then you can always bonsai it too. Yeah, like, yeah, juniper is a bonsai. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one for you, Jess. Um, when can people expect to start to see results? for flowering or like you said it, you brought flowers home and it was immediate it, um, but you know should I don't people shouldn't expect immediate results right oh or I think it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty it's pretty instantaneous if immediate. you planted there like so these guys were kind of arguing over who got to say Pergamon but with bergamot, the, that thing, it blooms like what, in early June mm -hmm. until the end of August, and it's going to be a party all summer. Like, and you, you plant it the first year, and you're going to have it the whole We have it the first year. It's yeah. immediate. Like, if you plant a trembling yeah. aspen, you're going to have caterpillars over it. Like, you bring out a hop tree or a spice bush, you will have it. It's, it's going to happen this year. You know, so it's not. I think some people, when they ask that question, I think, but when is my tulip tree going to bloom? Well, yeah. And but it, it, the tulip tree is still supporting caterpillars long before you see it bloom, right? So oh, yeah. what, what successes are they looking for? Yeah, and that's so that's that's a good point is to be able to judge and gauge what that's your exactly expectations good. are, right? Yeah, so, right. You know, in some of our naturalization programs, Tallgrass Prairie on a large scale will be productive for several. Five years, yeah. but but if you're planting, you know, you're growing your seeds and you're doing smaller scales, so you're at, you can expect results. Yeah. Quite a bit. If you go to a native plant nursery and buy plants in four-inch pot, yeah, it's, it's, it's there. Yeah. Like, yeah. So there's some native the plants require like like a, or a rosette for uh, the first season and then the next season. Ooh. There's some by, and those, there's some yeah. that do that, but you can buy like Minarda. There's just things oh, yeah. you can, yeah. and you got blooms right right like with it. It's you know, awesome. Yeah, okay. yeah, the sunflowers. Those are all good things for a pot too. Back to that mm -hmm. that other question, like you could put woodland sunflower and um, uh, beet or uh, Minarda, I can't think of it. Bergamot, thank you. Yeah. Into a pot, yeah. and this year in that pot, you will have a party. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yep. Throw an aspen tree in there and call it. A <laughs> 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 um, so that that was one question I skipped uh, because obviously we're geographic and we're kind of in different areas, but. What, where would you, where should people go? There was a question of, well, how do I know native versus non-native? How do I do this? How do I do that? What? So you guys, you guys mentioned uh, Anjanam. They have a, a garden mm -hmm. and a green garden center. center. Yeah. So that's a great resource for anyone in the Sarnia yeah. area. Uh, and that's the only. I spell like Anjanam. Um, um, no, a okay. M J. A Throw okay. that into Google. The whole, the rest will come. Yeah. <laughs> like you can, you can finish spelling it, but the, like you only have to get that far, and it'll show right. <laughs> At the First Nations, like uh, yeah. rehabilitation site or greenhouse. No, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, there's a, great, a greenhouse. I was involved in the, yeah. the the whole construction of that, and I worked there for three years. Um, right now, um, uh, Dylan Henry's running it. It kind of went out of COVID. Kind of gave it a bad blow there, and then they kind of went out of business. But they're getting it back running this year. Um, so it's between Corona and Shell, not too far from Shell, two blocks from the yeah. river. Jess, you have yours in the Grand Bend, Bedford area. Yeah, right? Bedford native plants. Yeah, and is there any down around Wallaceford? Uh, not specific to, well, actually, yeah. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, um, Golden Alexanders. That's, yeah. so, that's so, Sarnia. That's Sarnia area. Heavenly Earth. Yeah. And, and Heavenly, Heavenly Earth, Earth is Bothwell, Florence. Timsville, Bothwell area. Yeah, yeah. What's that, Heavenly Earth? 
Uh, trees and shrubs, mostly trees and shrubs. Yeah. But you got to tell her you're looking for native plants. Liz yeah. isn't, she's not a purist. Someone yeah. added Golden Alexander's? Yes, there's a yeah. nursery called Golden Alexander's out on Churchill Road outside of Sarnia. Okay, so a couple people have typed in the chat. Okay, yeah, good. They spelled it like that. Oh, good that's, for them. That's Nick Alexander who's doing that. And he's doing a fabulous job and he knows he knows everything, and he just, he's such a good hard worker, and he's so dedicated. Like, you go see Nick, and he's going to help you big um, time. Also going to drop a plug for the SFN Native Plant Bill. Oh, yeah. So every every spring. Uh, yeah. And uh, it'll be in May, early May. It's, it's always uh, the weekend in May. Yeah. So Saturday will go long weekend. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a long weekend. Yeah, and it's, it's, held at our, it's held at our family farm. Now, uh, oh, okay. a couple of years, which north of Wallsburg. So. Three Forest London is also having a native plant. <laughs> I noticed that because this is now the craze, you see big box stores with like native plants, but it's not really the native plant. Is there any? Is there any way of knowing? It's, so it's, there's, so no there's, there's, there's no I'm regulation gonna, to say. I'm just going to make sure that's true. So the question yeah. was, um, you know, it's because native plants native has come up. A trendy thing, big box stores are, are making native uh, seeds available. So what is the best way to guarantee that you are buying native plants or native seeds? We're not feeling like it's not question on it. by native that's from yeah. Oklahoma, but it's yeah. not native to here, right? Well, it's that's not that it's not native to that does That does happen. Right. A lot of that happens less. But what when it comes to native plants, there's also something like regionally specific. There are plants that grow in southern Ontario that also grow in Thunder Bay. You would not want to move a plant from no. Thunder Bay to there. So you may be getting, when you buy from a big box store, you have absolutely no idea that the origin of the seed store. Okay. Right. Oftentimes it is coming out of America. Right. And then secondly, that, that whole issue with the butterfly or the, the trillium right. bacteria rot. Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah. like, and now <clears throat> like they're growing, like, because um, what's his name? Sean McKnight grows trillions in his backyard and he propagates them the way that trillions would normally propagate and i've never had an issue with them but i do know from a big box store that grows them locally they're using these little corms or something like that and then they end up with the bacteria and then they've infected people other plants with these diseases so native plants are finicky and so you like there's like okay yes <laughs> but some of these like when you get into some of your like mertensias and or what's that called um but either way, some of these plants, those ones are finicky. So when you start to get them, like when you're trying to push 98% germination rate on a plant that has a germination rate naturally of like 20%, you just don't know what you're doing to the, the outside population. Of this. Like I do really believe in, in having it like these small nurseries. Um, what's your name is the only one that I've ever seen, Liz from Heavenly Earth. She grows hepatica, but she grows hepatica the way that hepatica grows, which is that it's in a woodlot, and she goes out to her own woodlot, and she harvests them every year and gives them to yeah. for sale. And so, like, I, I do believe that we should kind of honor this, this, like, it's one thing if it's like a Menarda or a, sorry, a Bergamot. Mm -hmm. yeah. These plants that, that naturally have an incredibly high germination rate, but when you start getting into what was your I need to have that H A H D H that that okay. stuff, and you get into these finicky ones, you have to be really careful. And then my my last thing is to support these local growers. Like if you want it to be local yes, stock, yes. like spending ninety five percent of your money at at Home Depot or at some major nursery, and then coming for those I need to have those, you're not actually investing in the culture of native plants. So like it's it's a tricky business to be in, so support the people. For sure. I, I guess what I'm saying is that try to help people to encourage the support, yeah. not to fall into the trap that when you're at Home Depot, see the native and go, okay, I'm going to grab that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Like, it is, it, it, it's, it's, to me, it's very much greenwashing. Yeah. And I know, like, Thetford Native Plants, Golden Alexander's, the Amgen on Greenhouse, those are all local source seeds. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Local like, source, hand picked locally. You know, they didn't order them in the mail and get them from, you know, Missouri or someplace. It's local source seed. And then you're getting the real thing. You're not going to get that at a big box store. But if you do that, you can do that as well. And if you have your, you have your trays, you can go. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can go harvest them yourself. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then if you have extras, go to the relief yeah. cycle. <laughs> Thank you.
uh, we, the Conservation Authority, uh, leases land to an organization called Ontario Native Escape. Right. And so Ontario Native Escape is a supplier of uh, native seeds, um, but seeds, but and they do grow plugs sometimes, right. but they're they're, they're I don't lawful, know, aren't they? They're lawful. Well, you, they don't sell to the public. Yeah, they don't sell. Oh. We like that for native plants buys their own. Oh, and really then, sometimes. So I'm the vice chair of Ontario Native Escape. Oh, okay. And we will sell to you if you want to buy some plugs. So you can reach out to Ontario. Yeah, reach out to Ontario Native Escape, and we probably can help you out. You can be. I didn't know that. So. So they're they're a wholesaler, and you're or they're no, a retailer. No, they're, so they're, I didn't know that they were the public. Larry is on their board. I'm on the board you, you for twenty some sell. years. Yeah. Um, okay. We will sell you some because we usually have a. I'll give we you guys, usually, I'm going to give you guys five minutes. What? To talk. Why? So I met, sorry, uh, Jason, and Catherine. Catherine. Jason and Catherine in Glencoe at a uh, landowner outreach. They're teachers in Glencoe, uh, and they have taken on, take on the mission of naturalizing their school. So they are working, they've done their, they, they've done their yard, um, and now they're doing it at school, and they've taken parts of the school. Um, the back corners. We did. Uh, we did twenty thousand acres. Uh, twenty thousand square feet. Twenty thousand square square feet. And so, so they're so far. So far, and they're here. They they're here because I told them about it, and they're here to learn. Okay. And so that's why they're asking questions. And they have All right. experience. Yes, I know. Uh, it's exciting though. <laughs> you definitely gave me the teacher vibe the whole time. But I I think because we have we're over time, and, and it's great to see you guys here, and you're a great example, and you. Drank the purple Kool Aid. Uh, <laughs> so be quiet. <laughs> no, 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 no. But just, I would I would like you to take five minutes mm -hmm. and just talk. Yeah, okay. we just um, we had uh, our whole mission. Well, we did what you did with the backyard, and we had people come in and say, "You got to cut that." And then some from the town came out and said, "No, just put like fences and stuff around it, and put signs in there, and just go for it." And so we did. And years later, my backyard is like what you guys have been doing. And then we just said, well, the school has so much green grass that's being nothing. So we just teamed up with other members and farmers and stuff like that. And we had to kill the grass on, on school grounds. It's not that I'm a big supporter of Roundup, but then if I could have killed the grass through Roundup, I would have. But we had like, we had to kill all the grass and then we put soil and we had stuff put down and wood chips and and then we started we seeded stuff in the backyard from conservations and germinated so much all those things on your list and planted them in and the kids came help plant it and then we created walk through gardens and we're just going and going and going and um can i ask you guys a yeah, question it's so amazing so because i feel like one it's like for other teachers to want to take this on the first question that they're going to ask is like what about the kids they have to be being stung by bees I so know. what is your answer they I feel do like not get stung by bees plants. at all yeah. bees like, are so busy around you doing stuff you're going to be sitting there looking at them we, and they're we try all to get hives right. but they won't let you hide oh, don't, don't, don't do hives don't do hives don't do hives don't do hives no not native bees I know I know but we put out like no hives anyone with um which school board are you with Ken Ken Valley. Valley. well they don't really i mean they do know we're doing it but and then this year we're going to have a ribbon cutting ceremony to have the, them all come out but no it's b hotels we were putting up b hotels yeah, oh, right, 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 right. you yeah, can yeah. actually solitary yeah. bees and all that kind of stuff so not bumble not, not um, high not honey high. but which they have their place but that is that's agricultural but um yeah, so anyway, it's just we're, we live in a bubble. So, I mean, this is us and a couple of our teenagers and some high school students, and we've been doing it for a couple of years, and, and it's so great when we met Jeff. Thank God he was there. And a few other guys that linked up with the Thames Valley Conservation because we want to get trees in. There's so much open space, and like you said in your pictures, when you build it, there's a walking track there, so lots of seniors yeah. are out there that are walking. Now they come and sit in the garden. Um, there's picnic tables that the high school is built, and we want the kids to get outside. And, and so we're just going and going and going, and Jason is a grant person. Oh, there's a grant, so he applies for a grant. And there's another grant, okay. we'll apply for a grant. And so and we're just building it off with, this, with the momentum that if we can do it, 
so can other people do it. And native gardens are so they're like, so easy. They're so easy. Yeah. And they're so yeah. beautiful. And you don't have to be weeding frenzy. No. And public, like, we do lots of signs and we've done storyboards and stuff to say, this is why things look the way they do. And I think when people understand why it looks like chaos, but then come to appreciate the chaos and what it provides, then it just kind of allows you to understand that that's part of the process. And then the rule, um, we were hooked up with the Dave Suzuki Foundation in Carolinia in Canada, and I became something called a butterfly ranger. Um, and with Zoom and COVID, boy, it was just a boomer, actually, because everything went online. So you could just learn so much stuff. And um, so yeah. signage is a great thing. And you guys want this to be an open space, right? Oh, so you said anybody it, can Glen Cove, totally. they're more than welcome anyway. to visit the high And school public school and systems, right? Like. Yeah. Students are there, but in the summertime, it's still public land. They're not going to yell at you for going back in there. And so there's kids in there riding their bikes, and seniors are walking around. And yeah, kind of hook up with other people and, yeah. and just see what other people are doing. Yeah. I'm glad she mentioned chaos. Because just one little note on, on your landscape kind of design thing is, is don't be doing the conventional horticulture industry landscape design where you have this nice, you know, plant here, and then like three, two or three feet of mulch, and another ice plant there, and another ice plant there. And, you know, even if they're native plants, okay, yeah. you need to plant densely. Yeah. You need to be creating habitat. Because if you just have one here and one there, and it's the same with oak trees. Somebody says, well, I say plant an oak tree, and they say, but I already have one. And I say, okay, how many caterpillars are in your oak tree? 1,000, 500? How many birds are in, your in, the, in that oak tree? Now, what if you had two oak trees? Well, now you have 2,000 caterpillars and 20 birds. What if you had three oak trees? Well, now you have three, now you're supporting 3,000. You know, like the carrying capacity of the garden, you need to plant densely. Okay, and, and then you don't have to ever weed again yeah. if you plant densely. Kathleen, there are people that are interested in what you're doing and maybe want to reach out to you. Would you feel comfortable? Oh, gosh, yeah. Like, I just think this is so beautiful. It's like making me happy. <laughs> what, what would you like? Do you have a, you know, yeah. <laughs> so my my I, husband's I, actually the teenager. I'm the, I'm oh, the, the teenager. I'm the teenager. She, <laughs> okay. yeah, but yeah, she can. I'm the mother. Okay. Do you want me to give it to you now? Yeah. Do it now, or you can sure. Do it later. Um, we can do it. We can do it later. Sure. Yeah. 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 Is that like? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, my small concern. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I saw it in there. Uh, if anybody, well, if you're going, that's good. No, thank you for coming. Um, is there any other questions or is there anything else the group, the panel would like to discuss? Yeah. Um, just as far as resources for edible native plants, is there a book or like somewhere we should look or it's just knowing the plants? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry because I don't have a resource no, for you. I all, don't. It's all introduced. Oh, <laughs> Uh, this is by a group out of Ohio called Indigenous Landscape. Oh yeah, you told and me about that book. book specifically on native plant agriculture. Um, two person team. Actually, can you shift in front of Larry's right? face? Yep. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they cool. have that's a really good book. They also have another one on um, basically it's a nursery model for native plant propagation. So this is another so really good nice. resource from them. Um, but I suggest follow them on Facebook. They post all, all kinds of really good information on Facebook. And then in regards to doing some research by yourself, uh, like the indigenous, it's called like a food forest when you're actually looking at the Aboriginal methodology in advance, like before us today, they called them, like they're called food forests. And so they're just kind of going back to some of these treaty rights and stuff like that. So it's becoming more popular. And those books are just indigenous landscapes? Yes. Is yes. that correct? And it's a good Facebook page. I think there's also like some um, Ontario guides too. Uh, it's like there, edibles of Ontario. Yes, edibles of Ontario. It's pretty. It, okay. it, it's well, like it is. You can look it up absolutely, but it's it's not that book. Okay. You know, it, it doesn't go nearly as far as um. So. <laughs> well, it's just the, the the Ontario guide is more about like high bush cranberry, blueberry. Yeah. It doesn't get into anything like the um, the coneflower, like the great headed coneflower and stuff like that. Where 
you're kind of looking at these more aboriginal uses of it versus just the things like hazelnut is edible. Surprise! You know, so that one's going to cover those very, very basic ones. But if you wanted to kind of get into native, like eating and growing native plants for sustenance, you need something that's a bit more, that's almost like the borderline of the agricultural commodities that have come out of the native plants of Ontario. A follow-up then. Um, does that touch on like mushrooms? And... No, I don't think so. It doesn't. I would say when it comes to collecting mushrooms other than a puffball, you should probably take, like go out with a mycologist. Because yeah. yeah. then you're getting into the world of sketch. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> like, I do it, but no, I, 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 I've it. done some but, Tell an audience, yeah, no. don't go out and start collecting mushrooms. No, no I should really ball. know. Yeah, puffball, you can't miss puffball. Yeah, ball, and it has to be white on the inside, pretty yeah, simple. Say, yeah. Not white. Yeah, you know, so like there is the, the simple ones and stuff like that, but even like Chicken of the Woods has yeah, look like some lookalikes look and stuff like yeah. that. Like, so you want to be like, go out, with, go out with the mushroom nerd and, um, mushroom. and they'll teach you. There's someone out in Guelph uh, named Luke Eckstein, and he hosts uh, mm -hmm. mushroom identification walks. Foraging walk. I think we had him with. Can I say one thing about the Woodlot Association that I forgot to say earlier? Sure. That we have because we have an AGM and we I think we've had him out to our tours. So our AGM and I have it on my phone. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on the executive. Yeah, he, he led that walk at Donald's place. Yeah, Donald's yeah. place with him. Doctor. Okay. Guy. Yeah, like I'm, I'm sure it's, I've missed. We're it. talking yeah. about Greg Thorne. Because he's a professor. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Okay, you're right, you're right, you're right. Thank you. Yeah. So the, it, oh. Which one? Luke Epstein or Greg Thorne? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and so the Southwest Woodlot Association is, um, it's for oftentimes woodlot owners or anyone who's interested in trees. And so I'm on the executive committee for that. And we're having our AGM on Saturday, March 25th at 1 p.m. to 4 p.m at the Burke Alvingston Arena. And it talks about, we're gonna talk about the OWA, what we do as the OWA. And then we have um, a pawpaw tree presentation. And so back to your edibles and stuff like that. And so all are welcome. And it's our 15th annual Woodlot um, meeting. So we just wanted to. What at 1 p.m. Alvingston Arena. And what date? 25th. March 25th. Larry will be there. He could ask you more questions. <laughs> and have any of you ever are affiliated with the Ken Talbot Land Trust? I am. <laughs> Do you volunteer work with them just at the Jones? I'm a stewardship and outreach coordinator. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So that's another. Yeah. Uh, You're Peyton? Yes, I am. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. I know who you are. Oh my God. I came because I saw you guys all at the panel. Um, but depending how you plant it, where you plant it, that might not be an issue. 
sitting in the lawn, and then you're mowing all the suckers. You never know what's trying to sucker, but so um, the cherry. I've had lumber that was what they call bush cherry. That'd be black cherry. Would that be black, black cherry? Black cherry, yeah. Okay. Prunus thuratina. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And in the world of edibles, like it goes up there with edibles, and you can use oh, yeah. smoking. Yeah. The robins don't get it first because they eat it. Good luck. You got a question? Do you, do you know we had a black cherry and it died, even though it suckered a couple of times, but it died out. Do you know if they're intolerant to with quite a, a, a lot of walnut? Walnut, but walnut kill them within your No, I wouldn't think so. No, they're not. No, no they're, up, they're in that forest complex with walnuts, so I wouldn't think so. They do get. Um, like a bacteria, like a bark bacteria. You'll see that when the, the, then what it is, the sappiness comes out of it, and then it, it gets a, a, like a wet rot in behind it. On a young so, tree or an older tree? It was probably eight years, nine, ten, maybe ten years old. It was about that, uh, it was about that, like the diameter was about that. Big. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. And it, it, Unusual. A couple branches one year went, and then the, the following year the whole thing went. That so sounds like I a vegetalium even yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah. It had a problem, obviously, so yeah. try it again yeah. and plant three. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have a question. Uh, what kind of plants would you recommend for, like, really areas that get, like, wet a lot and, like, <gasps> oh, so much wet? We got, we got, yeah, nothing. Button bush. Button bush. Button bush. Button bush. Yeah. Like, and then iris. <gasps> okay. Like, irises are beautiful, like, in the world of, like, yeah. Ironweed. Ironweed. Iron, well. I have a whole list of you know, I mean, purple flower. Oh, definitely. Oh, flower. and then blue lobelia. Yeah. yeah. Um, and swamp milkweed. Yeah. Yeah. Swamp yeah. They're so pretty. And actually, those those, those rain them. gardens will be the pretty prettiest flower colored garden you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those rain the, gardens. Uh, cardinal flowers yeah. are just startling. Like, bone set. Bone set. You know, <laughs> when I did that list earlier, I missed bone set because when bone sets in bloom. <laughs> When both sets in bloom, that's where all the pollinators are. Mm -hmm. That's a big one too. But yeah. tall one set. Question. So, when you look at a, a, a fallow field out, you know, that's left fallow for years, it, you get goldenrod and all the grasses come up. So, we're, we were talking the other day about why yeah, all the weeds come up, yeah. right? So, you never see cardinal flower out in that middle of that field. Okay. Is that because of the way the seed drops? Just it, it doesn't propagate? Like, you don't have. Yeah, so, why, so, why are these all these natives that. We all know and love, but other people don't. Like, who sees Blazing Star ever? Who sees Cardinal Flower ever? Except in, unless you're really putting dispersal. Winning. Yeah, it's a so you have to dispersal. But I did just watch this absolutely fascinating thing on on. It was somebody out of Chicago region, and they did prairie restoration. And so you can do, you can seed all of these prairie rehabilitations, but if you don't bring in mycorrhiza fungi, mm -hmm. there are certain species. Leatra spicata being one of them. Right. I would imagine that even with cardinal flower, like you're going to get into this issue where if you don't have the associate soil fungi, right. then you're not going to get germination. So if you had, say you had like a ravine on either side of it, and, and that was relatively undisturbed, you may find that those areas, if you seeded it in, would seed in sooner. Okay. Like if you actually put those plants in, because I do know with some of the MTO properties, we have areas where it, it works and where it doesn't work, but it has to do with actual. So I'd like to add to that is that you're talking about a fallow field. You're talking about something that's been anthropogenically impacted. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there there are plants whose job is to heal that land. Yeah. You know, pioneer species whose job, and, and it's based on what kind of nutrients are left in that soil as to which ones will grow. And the plants you're talking about are climax habitat plants. Okay. You know, like they're not just going to grow in a fallow field on their own until that fallow field evolves and starts to create some fungi um, environment and things like that. So, yeah, that's a tough start, right? Sometimes I'm surprised you can even grow a tree, and yet these guys grow trees like crazy out in fields, farm fields all the time. But, but a lot of them, you can see the nodules of the fungi on the berry seeds. Like you can see that they're, like where they're being grown. Yeah, oh, it'll come. Mm -hmm. It'll come, yeah. So I guess this is a good segue. Have you any of you uh, experimented with fungal inoculation in your? I want to buy this Michael Bloom stuff that's out of Chicago. And I do. We I take the so because I destroy habitat for a living. I'm like I I very much like I protect these plants really well. 
So if it's, if it's something special on those sites and I know it's going to get destroyed, I bring those and I bring dirt and dirt with them. These guys are I was going to say there is a product called Root Rescue um, that I've used quite successfully, and that's basically what it is. It's microbiome. Microbiome is a fungi that is designed for transplanting trees. So. I worked in a research project where it was an afforestation site in an old field as part of an aggregate mine. Um, and we did soil transfers from the donor forest that was going to be demolished um, to see whether or not, uh, first of all, plant crop fuels would continue to spread and whether or not it would accelerate tree growth. And there's differences. <laughs> so I guess like it could be the fungal networks in there. Yeah. That's the, the Michael Bloom presentation, which I can send you. Anyway, I was going to post on Native Plant Gardening. Can you say it's slow? Don't worry. That I'll speak to my grandfather. Um, but the Michael Bloom presentation had not only found that it improved, especially Fabaceae, so any of the legumous plants are the later blooming. But um, that this particular product reduces non native plants as well. So you're starting to shift the mycorrhizal fungi, so you're also shifting the, the susceptible, like the, the ones that are present without you inoculating it with native ones are favoring non-native plants because that's what was there at the weeds. So you have, it works in two directions. But there's our vascular mycorrhizal fungi and then there's the other ones. So the one you see in the store now, you see in like My, a box store. But she was, you should, I should, I should share it to you and you can share it to this group. Yeah. Because I had kind of said that the ones that are used, this is this was made in Chicago for tall grass prairie specifically. Oh. A lot of these other products are using like one or two fungi that are native to the world round. So they don't have the advantage, so they might help right. out. Uh -huh. Right. And that's why soil, she actually does, she examines like soil transplants yeah. because you're looking at these very specific ones. So if you wanted to help out the Fabiaceae, which is getting into a very narrow group of plants, you need to get into a very narrow group of the, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. But what I was going to say is that there's arbuscular and the other ones, I forget, but there's two different kinds. Prairie plants is arbuscular, trees is I can't come up with yeah. I can't think of the word, but there's a different type of mycorrhizal fungi, and that's for trees. So you can't use these prairie ones. Like it's it's it, it's really it's quite complicated. Like it's it's absolutely fascinating. It's interesting because in on our on our the school there we we had brought in. There's a company called Cangro in Albanston, and they get um, horse manure. And they squeeze it all the juice out of it, and they make a product. And we got all that spent horse manure stuff. That they well, it was used. no, it was it was mushroom. Oh, sorry, mushroom compost. compost. Yeah. So they were getting it from the mushroom compost places, or the uh, spent mushroom compost. And we got thirty-five four by four um, meter bags, like white bags. And and that's just been it's like gold. It's, it's allowing everything to grow up. So that will be. Which the, again, not, the mushrooms aren't going to actually be a native no, mushroom. No. What that is, is the actual... The, when, when you have, It'll, it's, I think it's a substrate for if there's any native... Yes, and it's the auxins. Like, yeah. it's all of the plant hormones that yeah. get... And that's why when you use, um, like, an animal manure versus yeah. a chemical fertilizer, it's the actual plant hormones that you would find in it. So I would think that the advantage would be, yes, substrate for mycorrhizal fungi, yeah. but also the actual plant yeah. hormones. Yeah. It'd be that it's beyond just the nutrients. Those hormones, your auxin, is a big deal. Uh, Jessica, I just, you mentioned two Facebook groups. Are they public? Oh yeah, Peyton should talk about Ontario Native Plant. I just, I was going to say in the chat that they did, just like you're sharing all the photos on there already, and it's like a place people can go to. Yeah. Hey, look at somebody wrote Peyton Lansford was there. No, what I'm talking the the Michael Bloom is a is a mycorrhizal. I'll put those presentations onto Ontario Native Plant Garden because I was going to, but I was like, oh, this is in the group of field naturalists is going to find this exciting, but I will. Thank <laughs> you. I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, yeah. I'm